down it doesn't matter what's going on it doesn't matter what kind of news we hear from the Murray Darling or how much taxpayers money has been spent to fix and remediate the problems that we've created in the south from dam building and from cropping etc and irrigated agriculture these proposals keep coming up and I guess that's our job our job is to get out there on the country and to talk to people and let them know what these threats are and what they will mean if they go ahead well, I'm uh, visiting Gulf communities in conjunction with the uh, Wilderness Society to tell them how we approached uh, the water resource planning process on the Cooper. He's an existing grazier within the Cooper Creek catchment. He leveraged the campaign that stopped cotton within the Cooper's Creek. And for the Wilderness Society, having that form of alliance with the graziers is quite unusual. Um, it's it's something that, that has worked over the last 10 years and having that friendship with Bob has meant that we've been able to plan to do this golf tour over the last couple of years. And Bob receiving the grant from Land and Water Australia has created this reality for us. We're now right in the midst of this golf tour, as exciting as it is. This is the start of our golf tour. We're, We're on, on the Wild, wild River Run. run. Tizer. and I must say I think I expected more people to turn up. We had four people um, at the end of it and I wouldn't say it was disappointing. I thought I'd be, I thought I would be disappointed having that small amount of people but we really, we had 100% support from those four people and they were people that were involved in river management and issues of recreational fishing, of um, catchment management within the Gulf Rivers. So we had really refreshing talks. We had talks that um, highlighted obviously Bob's story, but also brought in effect what we might be able to do for the Wild Rivers campaign and what kind of support we'd get on ground if we do have to leverage a campaign that would include gaining submissions, etc., to send to the state government to say, hey, we don't want irrigation in these rivers. And as far as I could tell, those four people were in support. So that's four more than we had before we started, um, before we got to Mount Isa. Interestingly, the same monsoon rains that feed these Gulf rivers are the ones that feed the Cooper. Um, the next uh, important similarity is that these rivers are highly variable, just like the Cooper is. The variability is often uh, just as much in, in many of these streams, particularly at the upstream end here. Um, the, the systems are both boom and bust systems. You get short periods of boom when the wet's on when there's flooding, followed by long dry periods, the, the classic northern dry, uh, where the actual ecosystems have to go into the bust mode or you know, the sleep mode, as you, if you like. The, uh, there are certain differences that, that are obvious. The Cooper is a massive floodplain system, whereas these systems don't have big floodplains. Uh, however, the, uh, both systems have very important and significant wetlands at the downstream ends. Um, and when the locals say, uh, well, the water that goes out to sea is wasted, well, uh, in a similar manner to the fact that there's no wa water wasted downstream in the Cooper, uh, the flows from these rivers into the sea are not wasted, but they perform very important, important functions in the lower wetlands and uh, in supporting the, uh, the estuarine and coastal environment, uh, particularly the fishing out there. Wow, what a meeting. I mean, we met two people that just happened to be holidaying from Adelaide 
like at the bottom end of the Murray-Darling Basin that deal with almost every issue you could possibly not want to deal with in water management issues like salinity, no water in the mouth, um, death of migratory birds and wetlands etc. And these people were fantastic. We are at what is often referred to as the arse end of the Murray and we get the feeling down in little old Adelaide that the people upstream have actually been told that they don't, quite some of them, that they don't care about what happens below the river, the rivers from, uh, where they live. And it's their water, not ours. We have no right to expect any of them. I mean, these tours are fantastic like that. You just don't know what you're going to get. But more than likely, you'll form and meet with people of the community that you wouldn't have ever expected to. And they're probably usually the best meetings you can have in life. And I guess one of, the, one of the big things for us at the moment, for the Wilderness Society and for the Wild Rivers campaign, is the fact that the state government have come out with a policy proposal and a promise to say they will protect Queensland's remaining wild rivers. For us, that was probably one of the best things that's happened so far in the campaign, and it may have cut about 10 years off our campaigning timelines that we thought we'd be able to get some form of legislation or protection for wild rivers. And when I'm talking about protection, I'm talking about keeping dams out, keeping land clearing out, keeping irrigated agriculture away from these rivers that still, on a miraculous level, still flow as they did pre-European settlement. And at the moment, um, there's about three rivers in the Gulf that exist that, that will will have been proposed to, to come under the state government's policy to protect wild rivers. And for us, it's good, but it's not enough. We believe that the majority of the Gulf rivers all function as one massive ecosystem. You can't distinguish these rivers out here during the wet season. You just can't. They form massive wetlands that, that last over two million hectares. Like these, these are rem remarkable tropical river systems. And we believe that they should be protected for all time and all of them. We don't want to see tiny threats coming in and, and causing sort of these rivers to go by death by a, by a hundred or a thousand cuts. We want to make sure that this whole system is protected for what it's worth, for the ecosystem, for its national and for its international significance. Interestingly, many of these rivers here have about the roughly same range of total um, maximum discharges, as it's called, the total flow, it, as the Cooper has. Uh, in that bracket, three to four million megalitres total flow. It mainly has meaning in the sense that um, that some people we've met up here think these rivers have much more water than the Cooper. They don't. One of the most important lessons I think that was learned in the uh, battle for the Cooper was the fact that uh, an alliance between local people, the uh, graziers, the uh, local townspeople, the conservation movement and the scientific community is a very powerful alliance. and. Uh, I think that's the alliance that resulted in a good outcome for the Cooper. Hoping it'll go well. I think it'll be, uh, be fairly good. There's a bit of interest around this country, and this is the we're getting closer to the country that uh, that uh, irrigation has been proposed in. So it'll be interesting. It's a pretty busy town. We've got a fantastic mayor around here, and I reckon if anywhere we're going to have some full-on discussions about what people want to use the water for, then we're probably going to have them here. I mean, it's been pretty quiet so far. I'd, I'd, I'm hoping that we have some interest. I'm hoping that we have a few people, that, decent people, to come in and have you know some good conversations about what they want to use their water for. And, and we, we, we've got to stop all our plans to farm. Yeah, I've got big plans to farm. And what, the yeah, right. what kind of farm? I don't know. We've got to find out, haven't we? But huge system plan of inland buildings for rivers. That's what I'm saying. More. This is the first meeting that we just haven't had anyone show up. I mean, out of any of the meetings that we were to hold in the Gulf Country, I, I did actually expect that we'd have some people here. I thought that people would be concerned knowing that, that these proposals exist only so close. We're talking kilometres away from here. These are the people that are going to be affected. And yeah, I, I, was, I was actually, I was looking forward to some healthy debate.
more than likely the word either one hasn't got around that these meetings are here and I think that's hard to believe because we've got a hell of a lot of radio, we've got a lot of coverage in paperback as well. I'm thinking maybe something's going on, maybe the posters are being ripped down, I, I mean I don't know, I could be pulling the straws there. It's just interesting, this is the first meeting that we just haven't had anyone show up. Uh, it's really disappointing not to see any of the graziers or any of the town's folk come and talk with us and express their opinions about water issues in this, this region. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty disappointed. I hope we have a chance to talk to some of the locals around here. I can tell from word on the street from the other towns that we've visited. Um, this is where it's all at. A lot of people here support irrigation in the Gulf. A lot of people want a dam on the Gilbert and a lot of people want to have water to facilitate their crops etc. So I just hope we have a few good discussions about what people are going to want in this region and I want to have those discussions and I also want to see if there's any people here that sort of look into the conservation values of the Gulf as well and see what kind of effects their want and need of irrigation might have on those rivers. So it should be interesting. Let's just hope some people turn up. I live on Highway 112 hour drive And we're gonna be Eating fish from the coal fire At the Shire Hall today we had our meeting um, in Georgetown and it was interesting we had two two people come and to take a, an afternoon out of their Saturday was quite a big thing for them I'm sure so I was pretty appreciative that we had some people rock up and were ready to talk about the issues that they're facing within this river system, the Gilbert River system. Um, it was interesting. I, I would have to say that um, I learned a hell of a lot from those meetings but at the same time I think that we came to some form of general understanding about where each of us were at us from the conservation side obviously and them from the water user side. The wild river concept like all things is feared a bit but mainly because we don't understand quite what that's going to involve. It wasn't clear to me what kind of water that they wanted to take from the system but I know that they wanted to diversify on their on their properties and that's what they were there to tell me. But they were also there to make clear that it's, it's, it's time to come up here more, it's time to get on the ground, it's time to spread our roots as you would say in, in the Gulf area because if we're going to be running a campaign up here we're going to have to need to know the local issues. It's an affront if they start saying that they're going to do certain things without talking to us, that's for sure. But, um, but yeah, no, I think it's, I think the conservationists as per we call them should re uh, come up and they may go away realising that there's, um, the people on the land up here are already conservationists. I think most of the people who live in the land have an intuitive understanding of the way that the rivers run but I think it's I think it is important for people involved in the process at least to understand some basic facts about hydrology first and secondly the ecology of rivers which is driven by their hydrology and they don't have to know that at a high level scientific basis uh, but it's important to understand the general linkages at the moment there's proposals to take water from the Gilbert, obviously during the wet season, um, to irrigate and not only sustain the existing mango and neem tree plantations, but also to look into cropping for um, lucerne, hay, etc. And no doubt down the road um, there'd be proposals to put cotton in this wonderfully wild system. The Gilbert has the largest flow out of the, any of the Gulf River systems. Um, it flows into the Gulf of Carpentaria, sustaining a very healthy and viable fishing and prawn industry. Um, at the moment there exists very, very small scale irrigation practices of mango and neem trees. The proposals that are looking into taking extra water from this system would mean that we'd have to be putting a weir across the river that you see behind me. Um, they'd be then looking at having off-stream water storages um, to pump and provide water for the cropping that they intend to have. The proposals are looking at f from 10 to 30,000 hectares worth of cropping and the water that they're looking at taking from this system would be around 190,000 megalitres per year. The problem being that this system is extremely variable. As you can see behind me, it's dry at the moment and during wet season there is no guarantee as to how much flow you are actually going to have. So if you're going to base an industry on a certain set amount of water that you're going to need to take every year, you're running into some sort of trouble there because there's no security in water flows up here.
we're getting into the upper Gulf country. And I tell you what, the issues up there are, are a lot more pertinent to taking water out of the system. So we've had a bit more of a response about the proposals that exist on the Flinders and the Gilbert. We've learnt also of some existing irrigation that we weren't aware of on the Leichhardt system where they're growing corn for a feedlot. And we've made some interesting connections. So we've got some networks on the ground now that are interested in maintaining a relationship with the Wilderness Society so we can keep them informed on what these proposals are doing and where they'll be going. Spectacular. It's absolutely spectacular. You can tell that it's a really precious part of the community here in Karumba. This is the hub of activity for the fishing industry of the Gulf of Carpentaria. These are the kind of industries that are going to be severely affected if you're going to start taking water out of the wild rivers of the Gulf. These are the kind of industries that rely on the pristine nature of this system that flushes out nutrients every wet season. Most of our tourism, um, Karumba especially, which is the, um, the mouth of the Norman River, is um, based on fishing and the recreation fishing sector. They're mostly the retired people that have been coming up here for many years and they stay for three to six months and their whole thing is to go fishing. No, I think it's very important that they don't, don't really affect this top of Australia. So if there's no fishing, there's no tourism, uh, but it won't happen overnight. Whereas with the prawn industry, if the um, water stocks are low, there's, there's a really strong relationship so that the prawn would really drop off. You would see it the first year, but with, with the tourism, it would take probably 10 years to really kick in. And then it would be like the Snowy River, you know, and then they'll go, oh, what happened? Here I am. What can I say? I'm in Karumba. I'm on the mouth of the Norman River. It feeds into the Gulf of Carpentaria and supports a viable fishing and prawn farming industry. The tour's coming to a close now. It's been quite a remarkable tour. I've learnt heaps along the way. And what I do know is that the Wilderness Society will continue to campaign to protect the wild rivers of the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's now, it's up to the community, it's up to the people of the Gulf to make their decisions on how their water will be utilised within this system. I can only hope it's used for the best. Let's not let these rivers go down the same path as the Murray-Darling Basin. They're too important to lose. Let's protect them as they are now. Go back.